I say, chaps, there's been a fair amount of whinging over this voicemail app and on your website, don't you think? I say, just let it happen, let it be, and see who leaves the voicemail and who says what. It's the Canadian experience, isn't it? To constantly wonder who likes me, who doesn't like me. Well, you're just going to have to toughen up, chaps. Cheers. So just because we don't quite understand how something works or why something works doesn't mean it doesn't work. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grime America show. Uh, we're going to be chatting with John Herlosky a little bit later, talking some remote viewing, doing a little remote viewing maybe, who knows? Stay tuned to the outro for a little fun. Uh, but first... As always, Gramerica. Gramerica, yeah. Thanks, buddy. The better half of Gramerica. Take it easy. So, yeah, stick around for the outro because we've been given some homework as uh, hosts and listeners. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for the coordinates and we can do a little exercise ourselves. I mean, we tried that once before on the show and it didn't work very well, but let's try it again. So yeah, I want to uh, mention some. I think last hey, time there was some like outside influences. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I want to mention some feedback right away at uh, at the show here. I want to thank some people for for sending their feedback. Um, we don't usually read reviews, especially from like iTunes and stuff like that. It just feels weird, but. We got an email from a, a listener, and, and he's uh, very descriptive about the show, and I do want to read it because it kind of explains. Pretty cool the way it explains okay. some stuff. Wait, but, wait for it. You don't say ham, you say spam. You don't say ham, you say spam. spam, 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 spam. Thanks, buddy. So I want to thank uh, Valve Monkey. And uh, Jennifer for sending in some feedback. And Gumbo, Gumbo 111 and Polydectus. I feel like I mentioned that one already at some point. And Gary and Jamie Sanchez, just to mention a few. Thanks. And Larry, too. Just some recent Larry feedback Case. and stuff. You betcha. Or Larry K. Yeah. Sounded like I said that anyway. But I want to read this out in case people are new to the show and they kind of get a sense for, for what we're all about. And this one's from Lance. It's an email. He says, I'm a podcast junkie and have tried many podcasts similar to Grimerica, like MU, which is Mysterious Universe, Graylian Report, THC, which is the Higher Side Chats, Intrepid, Open Minds, etc. And Grimerica is by far my fave. You rule them all. I've been listening to everything you have most twice and some many more times still like Randall Carlson. Jesus. I know it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's humbling, but I want to get into it. The thing I like most about beyond the, I'm just sitting around with a couple of cool friends banter as he is that you don't insult my intelligence. You allow me to hear and own the facts, theories, and ideas and choose for myself what to do with it. I can decide for myself what is bullshit and what is compelling. You give the presenters an honest and fair opportunity and don't insult them when you may not agree. You don't try and guide the conversation with stupid questions or well-timed cutoffs just to make sure the topic goes where you want it to. I really appreciate the manner in which you don't get in the guest's way and let them present their ideas as they have been seen proven best. It's not like they need the information teased out of them. They have likely presented their ideas in some manner and times it's stupid and they know what works best fuck that one up but sorry about that it's okay not as much as usual also no inferiority complexes here continually interrupting the guests butting in to say hey look at me and all this shit i know aren't i awesome it's refreshing and polite when you do pose questions or add something of your own it's well thought out and relevant not a distraction but rather a contribution helping to clarify ideas or draw possibly unnoticed connections and you do so with a laid-back and entertaining humor 
not all pretentious or dry. The two of you, three counting RPJ, are open-minded, but no one's fools. And the contrast in degrees of skepticism without seriously trying to compete with each other over who can be crowned as right is quite complimentary. Seriously arguing hosts are a real turnoff. Very well done and keep it up just as you do. Swears and all. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would love to hear interviews with Dean Radin and Lynn McTaggart and maybe Yoda if you can get them. Also, I would add this as a podcast review, but it looks like iTunes is the only real useful place. And I'm no Apple fanboy, so if you can suggest other places that would help, let us know. That's from... Go to Stitcher, you must. <laughs> Stitcher? Is that, is that think, the next well, best we place? We have one review on Stitcher, but I think that's probably the next best place. What about that podcast review place that you're talking about? That's just a place that correlates them for us. That's a service. Oh, oh, that, oh okay. That's a service. It takes like the US ones and the Canadian ones and all that and correlates yeah. them. Okay. So that was from uh, Liger Rider in Asheville. He says, P.S. To clarify your mispronunciation of my handle, Liger Rider, when you previously read my camping story, it's Liger, like tiger, as in the words of Napoleon Dynamite. It's pretty much my favorite animal, and it's like a lion and a tiger mixed, bred for its skills and magic. Yeah, so I ride these bitches like a horse, and I'm pretty badass. Thus, Liger Rider. You have the clip? I do have a clip. It's pretty funny. A liger. What's a liger? It's pretty much my favorite animal. It's like a lion and a tiger mixed. Bred for its skills and magic. <laughs> Bred for its skills and magic. That could have been me in 1985. That could be you anytime, man. <laughs> oh. Flip the switch. Oh, I wanted to mention about Lynn, Mc, Lynn McTaggart, too. Um, Lynn McTaggart was on our was wish list. Purpose? Yeah, yeah. No, Did Lynn McTaggart was on our wish list for right at the beginning. And it was obviously, it was hard to... Oh. <laughs> I that was you. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, yeah, Lynn McTaggart, uh, I loved her uh, book, The Field, and, and the Intention Experiment. She was on the list from the beginning. So uh, maybe now that we've had so many shows... Because I think I emailed her right away, and it was just really hard to get in contact with her. So now that we have a little, a couple of years under our belt, yeah, try her again. Yeah, is this our anniversary or our birthday? When? Oh, it's shit! It almost is, eh? What's today? Uh, not another week or two. So what next is, week? Next week's our two-year anniversary. Isn't it our birthday? Our birthday? Yeah, I guess it's our birthday. Or to your birthday. Yeah, I know. I thought of it as anniversary too, but it's really a birthday. America turns two. Terrible twos. That's right. Fucking hit the deck. All right, it's the profound UFO quote of the week. And this is uh, interesting. When you have the view of the airspace and the radar screen and you see the UFOs go around 20 or 30 miles a second, that is very real. They can turn suddenly almost 90 degrees in a second or a half a second. The UFOs can go vertically straight up and very quickly. That's from the Mexico City Senior Air Traffic Controller, Enrique Colbeck. Enrique. Yeah. DP, page 129. I don't know what that means, but... DPT? DP, page 129. Hmm. Speaking of uh, air traffic controllers and the senior ones, I was uh, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine, and uh, it's like a new friend, and he's a supervisor of a bunch of air traffic controllers. I'll keep it uh, Really? Like I'll keep fucking it vague. tin cup style? Yeah, as I mentioned, <laughs> like pushing tin, right? Or yeah. pushing tin, yeah. yeah. And uh, so he, he manages the air traffic controllers in a bunch of different airports. And I was asking him about UFOs and talking about it. He's super open-minded about it, which is great because sometimes, you know, you wonder what they're going to think of, right? And, and he mentioned uh, just recently there was like a multiple sighting where a bunch of airplane uh, pilots saw something and reported it in 
we built six, I think a few, uh, a few of them at once anyways. So I was mentioning to him, is it protocol that they report that? Because, you know, you wonder if it's like sort of part of the ridicule, but he says basically the Transport Canada, it's, I think it's uh, regulated that you should re- report anomalous uh, objects. Out there. Anomalous aerial and phenomena. It happens, and it happens a lot. So it's pretty cool to hear that from an air traffic controller. True that. Dude, are you clapping? <laughs> I did. Nice. Pretty excited. Can I continue I like on with the UFO uh, topic here? I like your enthusiasm. No problem, buddy. Do I finally get to read the the uh, orb sighting from Mark? Sure. Who's Mark? And Mark's uh, one of our listeners. He's got the orange orb sighting. Oh, let's hear it. He says, hey, Graham, I'm finally getting around to telling you my sighting. I'm from a town called Swan River in Manitoba with a population of 5,000 people. I've been watching the sky multiple times per night for the past five years. I live approximately two Ks from our west, west of our local airport. This sighting occurred mid-summer 2014 at approximately 12.30 a.m. The sky was clear, no wind, and all the stars were easily visible. From where I sit on my deck, I looked directly towards the airport. I was caught off guard by a movement that came from directly above me. I looked up and saw what I can only describe as an orange glowing orb that was moving east towards the airport at a high rate of speed. I watched it travel across the sky from above my head at, say, the 12 o'clock position to about the 9 o'clock position in about three seconds. It then stopped, which would have been about three houses away from me at about 1,000 feet above the ground. I then got my first good look at this orb as it remained stationary and can describe to you that its size would have been that of a basketball. I could see that it was round and it had a dark orange center. After about 20 seconds, the craft shot out what I could only describe to be a blue whitish beam of light. Much like how a lighthouse sends out a beam, it rotated in a counterclockwise manner. The beam made only one rotation around the sky. After that, the orb then moved slowly downward to the treetop level. I stood up to watch the orb slowly skirt around the north side of the airport. It then changed directions and traveled southeast around the outer perimeter, and then it traveled away towards the east as it flew out of my sight. So I was dumbfounded because I know this craft was not an airplane because it made no sound. It had no blinking aeronautical lights that would identify it as a commercial plane. I know it was not a Chinese lantern because the closing speed being many times faster than any jet I've ever seen in the sky. And lanterns cannot remain stationary for 20 seconds and then shoot out a freaking beam of light. It felt to me like it was searching for something and was intelligently controlled, much like a drone. Now the strange part. About one month later, it came back. I watched it do the exact same thing as it searched the airport and it flew away out of sight. It seemed like it was searching for something. So, Graham, that's my story as I saw it. Let me know what you think it may have been. Chinese lantern. I have no idea. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's an interesting sighting. I wonder if there was any of those uh, with the bluish-white beam recorded in Terry Ray's Orange Orb book. Invasion of the Orange Orbs. That was a big hit. That was a good one. That was a good episode. So if you're interested in more of those sightings, we talked to Terry Ray, who cataloged a shitload of those and mapped them out over the states, and it was a great interview. He might have been 100. It was either the last or the second last episode that we didn't have a number on, which seems like forever ago already. Right. This is 117, I think, or something like that. I want to mention something about that uh, Terry Ray episode. I have a listener comment here from Jenny. And she says, I wanted to comment last night after listening to this, but I had second thoughts and decided to wait 24 hours to think about it. I've thought about it and say, I have to say what my gut says. You asked Terry Ray if he thought the reason there is such a drastic decrease in orb reports this past year may be due to a government insider in MUFON who has access to reports that come in, but erases the reports. I noticed a long pause by Mr. Ray, and then his response that he highly doubts that. Okay, well, my gut thinks you may be spot on with your observation about the insider at MUFON. Have you heard of Dr. Jonathan Reed? There are some in the UFO community that think he's a hoax. I, for one, believe him. I have personally communicated with him via email about his situation. He is one of my favorite friends, and I have an autograph copy of his book. One of the first places he contacted, one of the first places he contacted after his encounter was MUFON. He 
His identity was basically erased and he lost his career, his girlfriend, his home, his beloved dog, Susie, and his entire lifestyle. And he was living a great life, a child psychologist and a very comfortable living. He was pursued by government agents immediately after contacting MUFON. In essence, I think that MUFON is a government-run agency. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that there are a lot of great, honest, hardworking people like Mr. Ray at MUFON. But I believe that MUFON cannot be entirely trusted. And the trolls and other such people have done their work to smear Dr. Reed. He had really suffered a great deal from his encounter. Sure, he has made some money on books and appearances, and so have other contactee experiences around the world. So thanks. Thanks, Jenny, for putting your thoughts together and the courage to write that out to us. Spam gram, which I say there's not been enough of lately. Darren's got a beef because he's got these synchronicity jingles and he can't play them. Synchronicity people... jingles. I got trip report jingles. I got. I got synchronicities like in my head from my own life, Darren. I can share with you anytime you're, we're short on listener ones. Okay. Now I don't know which jingle to play. I want a good skull for my synchronicity. Graham reads it out, then Darren might give it to me. Hey, don't you please read it low, yeah, yeah. So now this is on me now? I have to pull one out of the bag. Pull one out of the bag and I get to rate it. I haven't rated one and it seems like forever. Uh, I'll only tell you if I don't want it rated. So now it's just a personal one. There's no, like, it's not a complex synchronicity. It's just a a personal one. No, people appeal to people like you. So they'll appeal to you. They don't want me picking on your synchronicities. So they'll send in theirs. It's kind of like jumping on a grenade. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I took a UFO course in college in the mid-90s. Did you know about that? In college. Yeah. They had one at Douglas College. It was pretty cool. This guy had all the, like, a whole, like, handout and a, a, les- like a lesson, a, and you'd go, like, every night, and it'd be, like, hours of... It wasn't an actual college class. It was in Douglas College. Well, it was nighttime, night night school. Night school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. So I always remember the teacher, right? I always, I just, like, even though it was mid-90s or whatever, I always remembered it. So I'm in, let's say, 2009 or 10, 2009, 2009 or 10, I'm painting, like, as a career, I've got a painting company, right? So I'm painting, I'm listening to podcasts, and I'm just back into the UFO field, right? I've been thinking about this teacher, and I remembered his name and everything, and I was like, I wonder what he's doing. I wonder if he's still involved in all this, right? Because... And you wonder how it's been, what was it, 20, 95, let's say around 95 to, yeah, it was almost 20 years, right? Like 18 years later. And he's just in my head, I'm thinking about him, right? I'm painting in North Vancouver and I go to Starbucks there on the corner and I see this guy. I'm like, that looks like the teacher from my UFO class. And I'm looking at him, I go, it must be. It was like a day or two later after I had this major like thought about him. I was going on in my head for a while, right? About what he's been doing. And I wonder how he, I wanted to ask him about ufology, right? So I go up to him as if he's going to remember me. <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, uh, didn't you teach that, that course in, in UFOs and call it in Douglas college? And he looks at me like I'm crazy. And I said, no, don't, didn't you teach something in 1985? My name's Graham. And I, I was trying to like introduce myself to him. Like he'd remember me. <laughs> and finally he admits to, to teach in this course. Mm-hmm. And I was asking, like, trying to bug him, but like, so what, are you following it still? Like, how's everything going? And I've been, I've been thinking about it again, like trying to strike up this conversation with him and basically said it, he got sick of it and fed up of it for a while there and, and left it. But he mentioned Benjamin Grundy. He's like, I don't listen to any of that stuff. Cause I think I was listening to some crazy, like pretty extreme UFO paranormal radio network kind of stuff. Right. He said, no, I kind of follow Benjamin Grundy. I think he mentioned I think that's how I found Mysterious Universe. From your old college UFO professor? Yeah. I will not rate that. (laughs) It's more of a ripple stick anyway. Right. But I'm not going to. 
look all happy over there. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a interesting. It's one of those ones that's meaningful to me, right? Like, how can I think about this guy? I haven't seen him for like eighteen years. He doesn't even remember me, and I bump into him in a Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah, in Vancouver, Vancouver. North Vancouver, North. Lots Vancouver. of people. It's not a, like a. I know already. You're thinking, oh, is it the one Starbucks in like 20 miles? There's Starbucks all over the place there. Yeah. And I didn't even live in North. I didn't even spend a lot of time in North Van. Yeah. Anyways, don't Six. don't bother rating it. No, that's not bad. That's better than I expected. From you. From me. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> send in your synchronicities, please. Don't leave me hanging. Let Darren play his jingles. Damn straight. That also goes for like uh, trip reports, psychedelic experiences, UFO sightings, Sasquatch sightings, whatever, man. We want to hear about it. No yeah. judgment, no ridicule. Just general rambling. <laughs> I'm a rambling grand with synchronicities all over the web. And Darren is skeptical about everyone And don't believe it yet Remember for a while we were getting tons of lucid dream Oh, that too, yeah so, Yeah Hey, I want to mention something coming up here Before we forget, this should come out right beforehand But we got an email from Gary Gary K. For the past few years, I've missed the annual March Against Monsanto this year, I was smart enough to find out about it ahead of time. I've already emailed all of my friends to let them know. I was hoping I could get some some of our airtime to promote it on our show. So but I'm pro Monsanto. You're, you're pro, yeah, right. Nice try, buddy. Anyways, go to go to search it. There's a March Against Monsanto, uh, the 23rd of May. Here? Calgary? I think it's all over, buddy. All over? Yeah. Huh. I'll track it down and put a link in the show notes. You're a pro. Thanks, buddy. You are a pro. I was looking. I thought I had something else, but I'm oh, fucking it eludes me. I can't find it, whatever the fuck it was. <sighs> Frustrating. Well, I want to talk about uh, the others report, but I think I'll save that to um, the next time. time. Do, is there time? Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, I want to shout out to uh, to Todd. He does this, uh, got this app called The Others Report. And I'm just on the website now trying to uh, figure out, but I'd like to do this little segment where we could talk about um, some of the headlines that come on there. Like, So what he does is he, he correlates all these great news stories, the type of stuff we talk about. So he's got... Uh, uh, articles from Mysterious Universe, The Daily Grail, The Grailing Report, uh, websites like Humans Are Free, and he also puts uh, mutual UFO uh, network sightings on there. So some of the titles that you'd get, just to make it interesting here, is like that the New World or Order is Dying, 10 Recent Headlines That Offer Hope, The Mysterious Creator of the Siberian Wilderness is another one. There's one in here that's the 10, the 10 conspiracy, the top 10 conspiracies that actually came true or that actually ended up being true. That was one I kind of wanted to see if What's Darren wanted to one? read. Uh, there's the Enigma Lith. That's a hundred thousand year old electrical component found embedded in stone. Probably some sort of fossilized something or other. Woman recounts death experience. Contact in the Desert 2015, massive lineup of researchers lecturing about UFOs and aliens. That's from Open Minds. So it's pretty uh, pretty cool app, pretty cool website. Just saves you from searching all around, kind of correlates it all. So I wanted to read the 10 outrageous conspiracies that actually turned out to be true. You want to guess number 10? UFO landing or moon landing. <laughs> UFO landing. <laughs> You think that's turned out to be true? I can't find it. I can't get into it. I don't want to guess either. <laughs> I'd be just throwing out Hail Marys. Kennedy? No, none. I don't know any. Okay, number one, Gulf of Tonkin. Escalator oh, of the Vietnam War. Is that when we fucking blew up our own ship or they blew up their own ship or some shit? Yeah. The number two is the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. 
deliberate non-treatment of syphilis-infected patient, patients. Number three is Project MK Ultra, the CIA mind control program. So don't forget these are all conspiracies that ended up being true. Operation Northwoods, U.S. military had plans for false flag Cuban provocation. CIA drug trafficking in L.A. Operation Mockingbird, early incarnation of media control. That's probably one of my favorites. COINTELPRO, 1960s counterintelligence programs against activists. Operation Snow White, the Church of Scientology, infiltrated the government and stole information. National governments and corporations determined global economic policy in secret, the TPP and the TISA, etc. I like how they throw that little recent one in there. And then the U.S. government illegally spies on its own citizens. Ain't that a bitch. Yeah, some good ones in there. So we're not all just conspiracy quacks. Not all of us. <laughs> uh, so what do you got, buddy? I was about to say something, wasn't I? I lost it. Oh, yeah, you wanted to talk about your something, didn't you, in Vancouver? Oh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I left you a voicemail that you didn't play. <laughs> I can't figure out how to play them. Nice. So but I know that at least I know I, I got the email. <clears throat> the email? They emailed me and said you left the oh, voice right. oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just going to go to Vancouver on uh, June 6th, I think, to George Norian Friends. So it's like Richard Dolan's going to be there. So basically it's like an interactive evening at the Hard Rock Casino in Vancouver, or actually it's in Coquitlam. So I'm not too sure what it's going to be like. I think there's going to be like a little expo there like probably like a vendor room type thing and then george is gonna be with a bunch of guests from his uh coast to coast radio show and there'll be sort of some sort of interactivity going on or answering questions and all that so there's lots of tickets left still but i'll be going there with a couple friends so it'll be cool to uh to see people if uh i'll probably be wearing my Grand america shirt if oh you can bring easy in to, easy to spot a quarter yeah maybe. for sure maybe perfect oh yeah and we should say thanks to napoleon uh for the episode art uh, all the latest episode arts have been provided by him uh, if anyone else wants to take a crack at some they're more than welcome but big thanks to napoleon who's done the last he's doing a great job and of course check out his blog he's been pumping them out i know he said he's almost got a new one ready already um, of his lucid dreaming. So I guess this will be the start of a new dream now. Damn, I'm going to miss Meg Ryan. Well, I think she's in all of them. Not his, probably not his second series. She, she's his dream sign. That's true. She will be in lots of them. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> yeah, check that out. Find all the uh, Easter eggs. Yeah, you can. I think he said you can even message him. If you just put in the comments, you know, maybe yeah, put ideas or you can email him or something. I should get him a Gramerica email address. That's what I'll do. Yeah, Napoleon at Gramerica. Napoleon's tough to spell. So speaking of that, Darren gives out email addresses for subscribers. Uh, so we want to thank all the people that are subscribing because this is a value for value show with no ads, no interruptions, just lots of yabbering about interesting stuff, no corporate sponsors. So please uh, help out the show. Lots of ways to do that. Help us stay agenda free. Yeah. Turn you into the product. I, uh, yeah, we did have a new subscriber. I can't find it here, but, uh, he didn't say he wanted an email address. Uh, if you do want an email address, just let me know. Spam Graham and all, or spam me, or I can't find it. Um, anyway, yeah. yeah and reviews, the, reviews help out big time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, support the show, grammarica.ca slash support. Um, review the show, grammarica.ca slash iTunes. And that's about it. Sign up for the newsletter. That's right. Grammarica. Sign your friends up for the newsletter. Yeah. And tell friend. some friends. Just put your friend's email address in the newsletter and or send even, it to them. Even them. you sign up. It's like less than fucking. What? Less than 5%. Or are signed up for the newsletter everyone should be signed why wouldn't everyone be signed up for the newsletter yeah it just sends you reminders it's not like we're not selling anything it just sends you reminders about 
when the show's coming up and the UFO quotes and all that kind of stuff. So it's just kind of like a little summary thing. Yeah. Big thanks to Justin for that. Uh, all different tentacles of the value for value model. Grimerica Gemini. Enjoy the chat with John Herlosky, and we will see you in the outro. here this is buzzy willard i got your message and we heard you out here loud and clear y'all want voicemails you're going to get them i was over there my good buddy's house i'm not going to give you his name because that's not important here but we was out by his grandpappy's windmill we was loading the car an oldsmobile 442 hemi white lightning i don't need to say no more than that you know what's going on we saw an orb that I, I swear that thing was bigger. It was bigger than the entire barn. It come rushing at us, and we didn't have to think twice. We got underneath that old 442 Hemi, and we just got down there. Next thing we know, the car is a shaking and a wheeling all around. It comes up. We go running into the barn. Next thing you know, we're looking over there, and it's gone. Ain't nothing there. Come on back to the car. No white lightning. There is none of that liquor that we done distilled all by ourselves. It's gone. I don't know what you know, but I'm telling you right now, orbs like white lightning. And it just kills me to know that we just lost the entire load. You boys keep it up now. Okay, guys, in Grimerica tonight, we're going to be chatting with John Herlosky about all sorts of fun stuff. <coughs> Jesus. But first, uh, how's it going, buddy? Hey, I'm doing good. I'm excited for tonight. We've talked about... Uh, we won't be talking about Jesus, I don't think. No, no, we won't be. Well, you never know. He might come up. But we, uh, we've we talked about CIA's Project Stargate, and we've had people from the Monroe Institute on before. So this topic will be somewhat familiar to people, but I think we're going to hear a different take on it. We've got John Herlosky here, who's written a book called A Sorcerer's Apprentice, and it's a skeptic's journey into the CIA's Project Stargate. So it should be pretty interesting to hear his take. He's had a real interesting background. He's worked for a couple uh, large police departments. He's been trained in SWAT tactics as a de designated marksman. He sounds like a dangerous dude. <laughs> but he's also uh, he's also considered an expert in the field of human performance technology, so I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. And he's uh, the co-director and co-founder of a nonprofit think tank called the Institute of Evolutionary Technologies, as well as a co-director of Project Trojan Warrior 2, which is a mind-body integration training program. So sounds like he's coming from some kind of high-tech and some interesting training and then he and then he gets involved in this uh, project Stargate. So we're interested to hear all about that. So uh, without further ado, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you for inviting. me. Great. Yeah, we're looking forward to this. So I guess uh, you know, I mean, people have heard about Stargate quite a bit. It's been you know ever since it sort of unofficially or officially got shut down, whatever you whatever you believe on that front. Uh, people have sort of heard about it, and remote viewing is being trained. You know, all over. North America now in people's uh, church basements and community centers. <laughs> so, but maybe just get you to start by uh, summarizing what Project Stargate is, I guess, and then maybe we'll get into the, the backstory. You think everyone knows what remote viewing is? Uh, I mean, I yeah, think so. it's yeah, getting pretty common. Yeah. Pretty if yeah. they don't know, they're new. 
but we'll get John to explain anyways. Sounds like a plan. So yeah, tell us about Project Stargate. Well, back Summer, on the... Summary, anyways. Summary, anyways? Yeah. Okay. Basically, what it was was um, a groundbreaking program that was initiated by the CIA uh, to use people who were trained in a scientifically validated form of ESP mm -hmm. and to use that to spy on uh, the Soviet Union, China. Um, they also use it against uh, the drug lords as well. Huh. That's interesting. Yes. <laughs> and that ran for a couple decades, wasn't it? Uh, actually, a little over 25 years. Wow. Yeah. So you got to figure that if, if it ran that long <laughs> under the, the scrutiny of various uh, congressional committees, it had to be a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mind you, they were, they were peeking into the drug lords. So maybe they were just, you know, funding it that way. <laughs> ah, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll save that for later. So, okay. so, so that was in 25 years. So when did you enter, enter the program? Like, how did that happen? Well, the program actually ended in 1995. Oh, that's when it was. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And in late 1997, I happened to read a book um, by David Morehouse uh, by the name of Psychic War. Oh, my, my dad had that book. I found it actually as an audio book after, yeah. after he passed away, and I actually listened to the audio book. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. And the, interesting, the most interesting thing about the book was the fact, not so much the fact that the... CIA was involved in psychic espionage, the capital ESP, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that they took a special operations soldier, you know, a, a company commander in the Rangers, and trained him in the use of ESP. Hmm. That, that was the part that really intrigued me. I mean, how can you teach someone? ESP. So I bought the book and I read it in a single sitting hmm. and it just blew me away. I had never heard of any such a technology before. So I started reading up as much as I could and I tried to get a hold of Dr. Morehouse, but at the time he was overseas. But in 1999, the spring of 1999, um, I happened to see a notice uh, at UCLA that he was going to be there to teach a beginning and intermediate course in controlled remote viewing, mm. CRV. So I signed up for it right away. And that's how I got into this particular uh, program. Mm. So before that, you were, you were, were you doing those, um, what was I read? Like the human performance technology type stuff? Like, uh, and were you, into your physical kind of combat stuff, like the martial arts and all that. So it must've been hard if, if you were down that path, it must've been hard to, to realize that, wow, okay, like we can actually do more with, uh, <laughs> psychic abilities or, or the yeah. mind. Yeah. I was pretty much a skeptic. Um, when we were involved in Trojan Warrior 2, this was a program that was originally classified and it was run by the U S army for their special forces people. Mm -hmm. And when it was declassified um, in 1990, I had heard about the program after reading a book by one of its uh, uh, trainers, uh, Dr. Richard Strazzi Heckler. And I contacted him, and he thought it would be a great idea to use this particular technology for law enforcement to adapt it. Because this was right about the time that LAPD had the Rodney King um, incident. Yeah, yeah. And and we both felt that this type of a program would work out really well for a police department. Mm. And while we were researching different technologies to put in the program, I had come across remote viewing, but being a skeptic and being one of those people who had, number one, never had a psychic experience in my life, 
you know, I haven't seen a ghost or a UFO. And as far as I know, Elvis is still dead. <laughs> you know, um, I had never really had much of an interest in that particular technology. It wasn't until I read Dave's book that um, it really started to intrigue me. And it was because of the reason that they actually train people to do this that I got interested in. It. Right. Huh. So I, I kind of have a couple different questions. I'm not sure which angle to go on right now. I guess I want to talk about uh, um, the 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 time when you when you took the course. So the the book obviously kind of opened you up to the possibility. But was there a time during your training when you really realized that it was real, or or did you still have some sort of some reservations in the back of your head, going, "Oh, I don't know if this is really possible." Like, was there a moment when you realized, "Wow, this is true." That eureka moment? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Besides besides the book. Um, I would say that my, I always had um, reservations about the particular technology the entire, pretty much the entire time that I was with um, Morehouse learning this, uh, this technology. Mm -hmm. Because it just seemed so outrageous that, that from two sets, of four numbers that were randomly chosen, you could actually go to a place and bring back information on that place, even though it was distant in space and time in some cases. Yeah. It just it was just so difficult to get your head wrapped around that type of a concept. But I think the point where I realized that there was really something to this was in Dave's second class his advanced class um, called extended remote viewing and we had been sent against the um the mars sojourner rover at at the twin peaks area of mars and i had had an experience called a bilocation and a bilocation is where you identify so strongly with your target site that you begin to actually physically experience symptoms that you would if you were at actually at the target site. Wow. And because it was so real, I mean, it was as if I was actually there. I mean, I, it was such a mind bending experience because the clarity with which I was able to see was basically the same as you and I see every day. It was that clear an experience. And although it, when you are in this particular state, you cycle up and down through it. So sometimes it, it blurs out and then comes back again mm -hmm. because it's, a, it's, it's actually very much a chore to try and stay in the zone area. Yeah, yeah. When you are actually in the zone area, it is absolutely amazing. Now, was that the one, did you say it was on... Mars when you guys were remote viewing Mars? Yes, yes that was the, the target. The target was the Mars Sojourner rover. Wow. Was President Obama there? <laughs> <laughs> I looked, but I didn't see him. <laughs> Can you describe a little bit about what you did see? You know, it's funny because when we were given the target coordinates, um, Dave said that this was going to be a very interesting target, that we should relax and enjoy the experience. So when I dropped into the target area, um, I looked around and it was this relatively flat plain, and there were there were just rocks anywhere from pebbles all the way up to fist-sized rocks that were strewn all the way as far as I could see out to the horizon. And there were, as I was looking out to the horizon, there were these two small hills out there. And there was virtually nothing else. Huh. I mean, it was, it was like a desert tableau. At first, I was thinking that I was actually in Death Valley, that that was the target. But one of the things that I experienced, because at the time I was, a, I was undergoing a bilocation, was the fact that it felt like it was getting, it was getting really hard to breathe. I, I felt short of breath there. Interesting. And it was... It was very uncomfortable, actually. I, I mean, I wanted to, to like breathe, try to breathe more in, 
because I felt like I was I was short of breath when I was there. And another thing that that uh, started to um, become noticeable to me was the fact that if I tilted my head up and I looked up in the sky, you would see the sky went dark. It actually went black and you could see stars. But when I looked down towards the horizon, the black gave way to like this salmon colored sky. And it was just really strange. I mean, the horizon looked somewhat foreshortened as if it wasn't like if, if looking out towards the two hills, I was looking up and then at the point where the, the two hills peaked, there was like a big cliff on the other side, right? And I couldn't see the, uh, the valley below or whatever. It just seemed like it was really foreshortened. And as I was contemplating this, I heard a, um, this high-pitched sound, and I saw a, what I, I thought was a dust devil go whirling by. And the interesting thing was, was that I could see these, well, it looked like electrical sparks or, um, or fireflies that were inside the, the, uh, the vortex. And it was just, it was all surreal. And I was thinking to myself, well, if Dave said this was a really interesting target, why is it all I'm looking at is just this big rock garden? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, where's the interest? So I started turning around and looking, and I, I didn't see anything. And then I just, for the hell of it, looked down at my feet, and there, right at my feet, was this rectangular-shaped panel. And it was this bluish red color and it had electronic wires um crisscrossing it and i was thinking to myself well whoa what, what's this so i started to step back to see what was what was there to get a better look at it and right at that time of course my friend who happened to be adjacent to me doing the same target uh fell asleep which is not unusual when you are doing an extended remote viewing session because you're actually in a very, very deep hypnagogic state, which is right on the edge of dream. Yeah. And so it's not unusual for a viewer to cycle down, fall asleep for a bit, then come back up. Well, he had fallen asleep, but unfortunately, he started to snore. <laughs> and he, this big snort came through and it like, it yanked me back from where I was to the room that all of us were in. And the only way I can explain the sensation was as if you were on one end of a stretched out rubber band and they let go one of the ends and you get snapped back that fast. And I had a like this vertigo going because it, it was such a dizzying sensation. Well, I tried to get back down to the target again, but the time allotted for that particular session was already up. So I, I drew my, my uh, session sketches and wrote down my summary and left it at that. Hmm. But the interesting thing was, you know, you're thinking, well, God, this was a boring session. Up until the point when Dave put the, the feedback up on the, um, uh, the viewer. Uh, the overhead viewer, and it, the target was, you know, the Mars Sojourner rover on Mars. And I, I mean, I had shown my sketches before he had shown the, um, the feedback to a couple of my friends who were taking the course with me. And then, you know, I showed them what I had. And I was telling them, you know, I, I don't think I was anywhere. I think I was just dreaming. Well, of course, I wasn't dreaming at all. I had described the area absolutely perfectly. Wow. In fact, if you look at if you looked at the the view that was of the uh, the rover and the uh, expanse behind it that went out to the horizon, I described it almost exactly. So that panel was the rover. Probably. Yeah, yeah. It was the solar cell that was up on top of the rover. It's a flat, um, rectangular shaped panel that actually does um, appear blue. The reason I, it looked reddish blue to me was, of course, the atmosphere of Mars uh, tends to give you a reddish um, tin tint to everything there. 
Like, so it appeared bluish red to me. Is it uh, is it like riding a bike? Would you say, or like, or is it something that if you don't use it, you lose it? Um, you know, that's interesting. That's a, actually a good question. It, you you never lose the ability. Okay, your psychic antenna, so to speak, are always up, and it sometimes you will pick up impressions. You know, like during the day. Um, but your ability to successfully or accurately draw and um, bring back information does deteriorate if you don't practice. So most of the remote viewers out there that use this on a day that use this, um, uh, let's say on a uh, continuing basis, practice their their craft because you can lose your um, your accuracy level hmm. what did what do you think about the uh the, the people that had that similar experience or not the people but it was uh one of the famous remote viewers was seeing the the moon or the dark side of the moon or had an encounter where he actually had spotted a i think entities spotted him kind of in his you know alternate uh dimensional yeah. experience kind of See, the, being a skeptic, it was hard enough to wrap my head around the idea that remote viewing was real. I mean, I don't want to dismiss experiences like that because I did have something similar to that happen to me later on in Dave's classes. Right. Um, but... That's uh, it's just so far beyond what I'm really used to that I'm really uncomfortable with that. I mean, it was their experience. I understand they had that experience, and I believe that what they experienced was real for them. It's just hard for me to understand something like that. Is it the part where he would be noticed by some other entity that's hard for you to accept, um, or or just the, that he saw or what he saw up there? Well, it's what he saw up there. I, I'm one of those skeptics that believe that uh, we haven't been visited by uh, alien advanced technology. Uh -huh. That's simply my opinion. I don't believe we have because I haven't seen enough evidence of it. Right. And when you understand the physics and technology necessary to travel between stars, and to realize just how far apart stars really are, um, you begin to realize that searching for another civilization um, in our, at our level of technology becomes, I mean, searching for a needle in a, a haystack the size of the state of California would be easy in comparison. Yeah, via a spaceship, not your consciousness, obviously. Right, right, yeah. exactly. But, you know, I've, had some absolutely amazing experiences on that particular level where it wasn't the moon that I was at, but rather far out in deep space where I had experiences like that, that I, you know, all I can say is, well, if I was able to accurately describe the Sojourner rover on Mars to that extent, then you have to give my experience that I had or they had um, with a target that was off planet where feedback isn't really possible, you still have to give it some credence because the technology used was exactly the same. Is, uh, what about time? Is time an issue? Like, can you only look at what's happening now? Can you look, oh. is there a limit on how far back or how far forward you can go if it's possible at all? As far as we have been able to ascertain, uh, there are no limits in space or time. Um, you can access the past just as easily as you can the present. Um, accessing the future, yes, it is possible, but we still don't quite understand what that means. I mean, if you're able to look into the future, and let's say we saw 9 11, and I use that because I accidentally did have an experience where I was privy to that particular experience 
96 hours before it actually happened, although I didn't realize it at the time. Of course, yeah. It wasn't until afterwards that um, I realized where the connection lay. But let's say, you know, you, you get into ideas where, well, if you know what's going to happen and you take steps to make sure that it doesn't happen and it doesn't happen, did what you see actually <laughs> was part of the future? <laughs> yeah, or was it just you know a possibility? I mean? or... Just a possibility. I mean, you get Only into possibilities. Really, <laughs> yes. You get into some really mind-bending thoughts when you start playing with the future like that. Yeah, yeah. See, my conspiratorial mind goes to, like, the past, and, and what if the CIA had these people doing this and they realized that it's somewhat reliable, like wouldn't you have people going back to those important uh, Wait, it's not, you're not times in the past? Time to, traveling, you're only looking. Well, no, you, you go can't back. Interact. Well, you can read books and like read read important documents. Like you can find the true history of things, right? Whether it's about the occult or certain things like that would give them I don't know. power. Can you right? like open a book? Can you? No, you can only look at the book closed on the counter. I imagine, right? Well. There are some limitations to remote viewing. Um, it's primarily a right-brained aspect, so that when you are viewing something, um, you tend to see things as they are, but viewing things like numbers and letters and written stuff is much more difficult. It can be done, and it has been and it has happened. Um, remote viewers have actually um, accessed written documents inside of safes and been able to decipher some of the writing in there. Hmm. But it, it's not usual and it is difficult, but it is possible. Huh. As, as for going back into the past, yes, it's, it's very easy. As a matter of fact, um, it's relatively routine to a remote viewer. Now, going into the future, Yes, but because of the fact it is in the future, um, you you have to wonder exactly if you are seeing things that are really going to happen and and there's no way you can change them, which means, you know, are we predestined? Or, you know, can you change the future if you have future knowledge of it? Wow, and, I'll give, yeah. and I'll give you an example. Um, Paul Smith, uh, one of the original military remote viewers, uh, when he was at the Fort Meade Stargate unit one day, he had been tasked by one of the project managers on, a, on what is called an open search outward. And in an open search outward, you get coordinates to a target, but the target is like a wild card. It isn't assigned to any particular target. Mm -hmm. It's simply like a shotgun blast into the matrix uh, to see what's out there, what's interesting, what's going to happen in the future. Well, the project manager was looking for something UFO related, but um, Paul described a warship that had been hit by a missile which exploded and caused death and destruction. And so they, they wrote up everything. They wrote up the, uh, the session as an actual possibility that might happen in the near future, you know, so that the warning would go out to the U.S. Navy that you know, there are possibilities out there that might mean that you may be attacked in the next 48 hours or so. Well... <laughs> It was sent up the chain of command, but they don't know whether it was listened to or not. Hmm. Uh, but 48 hours after Paul had done the, <coughs> the actual viewing, the USS Stark in the Gulf of Sidra was hit by a missile fired by an Iranian warplane. And Paul's description of what happened virtually matched exactly what happened on that ship. That'll learn you. Wow. Yeah, yeah that was <laughs> That was 48 hours into the future. But, but once again, you know, that brings up the thought. What if they had listened? What if they had put that alert out? And the Stark, instead of being in a regular, you know, relaxed condition too, uh, 
mm-hmm. was in general quarters. They had their radars up and running, and they had their um, uh, point defense weapons ready to go. And they destroyed the missile. What then would that mean about the the viewing that Paul had done? He described an explosion. If they had listened to the um, the warning, and the Stark had fired and and hit the missile and destroyed it before it hit the ship, then his description of the death and destruction on the ship would have been wrong. Wow. Yeah, it, it makes you think. I wonder if we, it's too bad we don't have more examples of where, you know, history is altered because of that. But I guess it's hard to prove that too, because, yeah. uh, you know, they, <laughs> they um, it's unverifiable. Well, not yeah, only that, yeah. but prove in a, in a soft way too. Like just that if Buddy saw something happen and then you change the course and you say, well, it just never happened. So it's kind of, yeah, it's like an oxymoron yeah. or something. Hmm. Yeah, it's um, it kind of interesting because when you deal with the future, you're dealing in a situation in the unrealized. So if by seeing the future, can you change that future? Um, interesting thought because it has it has connections then with the ideas of free will versus predetermination do we really have free will is that an illusion i mean we already had free will you know or is everything predetermined is the future fixed wonder if it's just like time's not linear so we already made all those choices or who knows, you know, that's like, that's oh, where that's, shit yeah. gets crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can really bend your mind around something like this. Yeah. When you're talking about the reading, it, it, it made me think, yeah, it makes sense because when you're reminding me of the lucid dreaming, like one of the ways to realize that you're actually dreaming is to read something and then turn around and read it again. And it's like very hard to read something in a, in a dream. Like it basically, it's very fluid. So it, yeah, sounds, it sounds similar. There's the reason um, why that is, and that is because remote viewing essentially brings your unconscious up into the conscious. It's a communication between your conscious mind and your unconscious mind, because your unconscious mind has its, is connected on a very fundamental level with, I don't know, creation, if you want to call it that. Yeah, yeah the akashic records or whatever however you want to label that we label it uh the matrix yeah okay of all creation but essentially what you're what it seems to be is that that your unconscious mind has a connection with the wave function of the universe and so all information uh irrespective of time or distance is available to your unconscious and all you're doing is simply teaching a manner of communication between your conscious mind and your unconscious mind. Now, the reason that reading letters and numbers and names and things like that is difficult is because your unconscious mind doesn't function like that. That's a left-brain function, okay? That's analytical. That's uh, logical you know, math and, and reading skills. That's all um, right, um, excuse me, left-brained. Whereas with your, with, with your unconscious, it uses things like allegory. And I'll give you an example of, of how the, the unconscious mind can uh, communicate with a remote viewer. We were given a target uh, one day, and my good friend Sandra, um, described dolphin, okay, on this target. She kept seeing dolphin for some reason. Well, the target was the opera house in Sydney Harbor. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the designer who designed the Sydney Opera House actually called the structure the dolphin. <laughs> Those uh, shell-shaped curves on there was designed to look like several dolphins um, surfacing through the water, you know, the curved back. So he actually calls it the dolphin. So you see, that's the reason why Sandra kept seeing dolphins 
when she went to that target because her unconscious mind was speaking to her in allegory. So that her description of dolphins actually was spot on. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's actually, and there are a number of other um, uh, situations where remote viewers have, have had allegory, which um, actually describes uh, parts of the target. So I, it's an unusual thing to happen. I guess we shouldn't, we shouldn't gloss over the 9-11 premonition either. Could you tell us a bit about what you saw there? Like sure. who done it? <laughs> who done it? Yeah, there you go. We don't have to go there. <laughs> um, that was actually a fluke. It was purely fortuitous. I was working with a, um, a scientist by the name of Marty Rosenblatt. And he was doing research in associative remote viewing, which is a type of remote viewing um, that is used for uh, forced choice decisions. Meaning you have a, um, a binary choice, either this choice or that choice. Okay. And remote, this type of remote viewing is used to look ahead in time. And this is one of its one of the cases where you actually do use time travel to see what's going to happen into the future. You don't actually see what's happening, but rather you assign something to, in this case, it was pictures. You'd assign a certain picture to one choice and sign, assign a different picture to another choice. And to illustrate that, let me, let me use what uh, happened in this particular instance. And that was, Marty was looking at stock options. He wanted to know whether a particular stock option in, what was it, uh, three days hence, I think it was, were either going to um, rise or stay the same or fall. So that was the choice. Is this stock option going to go up or is it going to stay the same or drop? So those were the two forced choices here on this particular experiment. Now, Marty had this computer program called MISTI, which took two pictures from a large pool of photographs taken of various objects and things all around, from all around the world. And the idea was the computer would choose one picture that would be shown in the future for one outcome and a different picture if the outcome was the other choice. So what you were doing is you weren't actually looking to, to see what the event actually was. You were going to view into the future your feedback for what actually happened. So in this case, the computer chose one picture, which was of a tree-lined path through a forest, and the other picture was um, the Twin Towers. Now, the computer had chosen the tree-lined path if the um, uh, stock option had stayed the same or dropped, and it had chosen the picture of the uh, Twin Towers if the stock option was going to go up. Now this is interesting because you don't, you are shown, after you do your viewing, you write down, you know, your description of the picture that you're going to be shown in three days, okay? When you make your choice, the, the computer brings up both pictures. And it doesn't tell you which picture is which or what it's assigned to. It just shows you the two pictures. And you have to choose between the two pictures mm. which one of them looks like what you are going to be shown by the computer after it's found out what that stock option does. And the computer at that time will only show you one of those two pictures based on whether or not it went up or it stayed the same or went down. So... To me, I was looking at a cityscape. I was seeing buildings and bridges and water and boats and stuff like that. So 
The other picture of the tree-lined path had absolutely no correspondence to anything that I saw that was going to be shown to me in the future. So that's what I chose as the, the picture that was going to be shown to me 96 hours hence. Wow. Well, not only did I see the buildings and all of that, I also saw a bunch of stuff that, at the time, didn't make any sense to me. I saw two large spired or jagged craters that um, were not smooth top. They were really jagged. And I saw lots of, I thought it was snow because it was light colored, but it could have been, you know, a lot of dust cloud or something like that. I also saw lots of dogs and I saw what appeared to be, it looked like it was either the fuselage of an airplane or a train. You know, like a subway train, because it was round, I mean cylindrical, but it had windows on the side, and the front end was flat. Okay? I wrote down all of these impressions, even though, you know, it, they didn't have any correspondence, I thought, at the time, to the picture I was looking at, simply because I just figured it was what we call AOL, or analytical overlay which is simply your mind attempt to put a label on what you're seeing. Hmm. So I wrote it all up. I made my choice and didn't think anything of it. Well, on December or September 11th, um, I went back to the library where I was doing the experiment. And as I walked through the door, I thought it rather interesting that they had a TV monitor up on the... Um, the librarian's desk and it was you know there was a television program going on and i had never seen anything like that happen before in the library usually they try and keep things quiet but i didn't put any credence to it and i had gone to the library right after getting up i had not listened to the radio or turned the tv on or anything like that i just grabbed some coffee something to eat and went out the door because i wanted to see what the the results were so I, I sat down on the, um, at the computer console and pulled up uh, the search engine in order to go to Marty's uh, MISTI site. And I saw a picture of what appeared to be a, a jetliner crashing into the side of a, of a building. And I thought to myself, wow, they can really do really cool things nowadays with computer-generated imagery. <laughs> You know, because I, had, I, I wasn't reading anything. I just happened to glance at the picture. I was busily typing in the, um, the into the search engine the, Euro, the URL for Marty's site. So I went to the site and um, put my passwords in and everything, and it the asked the computer to bring up the picture that was the proper response. Well, to, to my dismay, it wasn't what I saw. It was the tree-lined path because the stock option had fallen precipitously. And I was just, I was just really chagrined. I mean, I thought to myself, God, I, how could I have missed this one? You know, I had seen everything in that other picture. The, the picture of the tree-lined path had nothing to do with what I had seen. Right. Right? So I was just really dejected. I just thought to myself, man, this is going to drop my my uh, average because you know we were scoring multiple trials and you know it made me question once again my belief in the ability of remote viewing because being a skeptic it's it, that's always in the back of your mind whenever you do a, a remote viewing session you know am i really seeing this am i really doing this and at the time I was still had ambivalent feelings about this particular technology. So I closed the web the the search engine out without even looking at the uh, what was going on. I was just so dejected that I just, you know, shut it down and just got up and left. So I still didn't know what had happened. So I drove home and I threw the my paperwork because I had printed out the, the actual pictures of the of what I chose and what actually was the correct site mm -hmm. and I'd toss them on my desk and 
um, I was just, you know, just really pissed off at myself. So I, I turned the boob tube on to just kind of channel surf for a bit. And of course, the news was on every channel, it wouldn't matter where you went. And they were talking about, you know, the, the situation. And I was looking at the Twin Towers, and it didn't really um, register with me what I was looking at. You know, they were, they were showing the, the buildings from, from really close up, and they were only showing one building at a time. And mm -hmm. they were, you know, the smoke coming out and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the fire and the flames and everything. And it didn't register with me. And I'm thinking, God bless, when did this happen? You know, and they started telling, you know, this had happened, just happened, and this is coming to you live, and all this other stuff. And then they took a shot from the helicopter from across the river, and it almost exactly duplicated the shot, except from a higher vantage point, of the one that I had been given by the computer that I had printed out. And when they showed that to me, something clicked in my mind, and I thought, oh my God, that's, that's the feedback picture. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I, I immediately went over to my desk, you know, started throwing stuff around saying, what did I do with that shot? What did I do with that shot? And I found it and I looked at it and I thought, holy crap. And I looked at, because I kept the paperwork that I had written all of the, um, the note, my notes on and looked at it and thought, holy crap. I actually saw it back on Friday because that's when I had done the actual original viewing of the target. And because the computer had chosen the target, you know, at random that happened to be the twin towers. I think that's part of the reason why I managed to intercept what was happening 96 hours in advance of when it actually did. And the interesting thing is, is that the stock actually dropped so the correct picture was the other picture. Yeah. Yet, yet this incident was so powerful in its impact on human consciousness that it intruded on my session <laughs> such that I was able to see what was happening that far in advance. That's funny because I was going to ask, it always seems like uh, when we talk about these things that emotion seems to play a role somehow, like large groups of this of kind of consecutive emotion can somehow warp it or somehow have an effect that's measurable as very much in fact they actually after reports started coming in from various remote viewers of a similar situation like this and other aspects such as what i i told you about with paul smith they they started what is called the the global consciousness project yeah and and what they did was they had um, random number generators scattered across the planet. And they tried to correlate changes in the output from random to non-random when significant uh, global situations occurred like 9-11. And they found that there was a definite correlation between really emotional impact type events happening in the world and the change in the output of these random number generators. Hmm. So in the, the wave function of the universe, evidently these are impacts that cause ripples that travel through space and time and remote viewers, because they have their, if you will, their foot dipped in the pool, are able to connect with what is going on like yeah yeah that's well said hmm. so how do you feel about getting a little personal here about the current paradigm we're living in and how you know we are still kind of controlled isn't the right word but still kind of living under the thumb of the materialist dogma and, and the you know that we're just biological robots as some of our guests would say and that that none of this is possible and you can't measure it. So it's not true. We'll just put it in that bucket and ignore it over there. Like, how do you feel now that you've kind of, <clears throat> you know, turned this corner in your life and do you ever worry about that? Does it concern you? Oh yeah. That's a, that's actually, that's an, uh, an excellent point because that's actually the reason why I, I wrote the book and you're right. 
Um, Dave used to call it the unconscious of the conscious. People go out, go through their lives in this, I don't know, state of light hypnosis. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they are so focused in on their lives and their, you know, who's paying the bills, and social media, and all these other things. And they've closed their minds off to the real truth that's out there. You know, the, the actual reality of our universe. Um, it's, I agree with you completely that, um, this is like a measure of control, not unlike that portrayed in the movie, The Matrix, where, you know, the government controls your, your news and your, your perception of what's going on in the world. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is there's more that exists in your philosophy than what you believe in. There's a whole world out there beyond what you believe is true. And you, you can see that with the evolution of science. I mean, when you, when you think back um, for, for basically a thousand years or more, you know, the earth was the center of the universe. You know, everything revolved around the earth. And then of course, um, with Galileo and Copernicus, you know, you, you realize, well, I guess the earth isn't the center of the universe. You know, we are actually uh, revolving around the sun, but it was a me mechanistic universe. I mean, Newton held sway with the idea of a clockwork universe. If you use Newton's, um, uh, mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, you could predict where a planet was going to be, where a star was going to be, and everything was like a clockwork. You know, it was like, a, like the whole universe was meshed together like a giant mechanism. And, you know, for what, several hundred years, that was the view of the universe. It was a giant mechanism, you know, and it was, it was you know, the sum of its parts. And that changed abruptly in the 20th century with the uh, development of uh, two of the greatest physical theories in human history, uh, the theory of relativity and the theory of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And the, the world of Newton suddenly morphed into this other world where things are not quite what they seem. And the clockwork universe was no longer a clockwork universe. It was a universe of sublime um, truth to it, you know, where particles have a schizoid um, existence where they can appear and reappear, you know, light years apart in an instant, where um, you can only know so much about a particle. And in the act of knowing that particle, you actually change the particle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, this is an entirely different universe that we inhabit now. So, you know, the ideas of people nowadays need to start to realize that we live in an incredibly sublime and mysterious universe. So just because we don't quite understand how something works or why something works doesn't mean it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. And, I think it's closer to the matrix than we think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's almost, and as a matter of fact, the Wachowski brothers actually chose the title to the movie based on um, the matrix description for remote viewers. That's where they got that idea. From. Oh, wow. And that's the way people act as if they were, you know, plugged into the matrix. You know, they're seeing things that, the news wants you to see, they're seeing things the way the government wants you to see it, and you need to open your mind. You cannot take anything at face value. You need to make your own decisions about not only life, but how you fit into life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like the old TV show, The X-Files, where Fox Mulder used to preach all the time, the truth is out there. You gotta look for it, though. Yeah. So I seem to want to ask this to almost all our guests for some reason, but I am interested in, in the answers. So you've been, since you took that first course in 99, it's been 
you know, a decade and a half or whatever, have you noticed um, an opening up of, of our consciousness and our minds? Like, what, how do you see the last kind of decade going? Uh, you, you know, know you it, the it, internet in there and yeah, yeah, the, I, uh, see, that's part of the problem. People get so immersed in everyday life stuff and with the advent of electronics that are just, you know, mind blowing and capabilities like, uh, smartphones, for instance, people start to tend to live their life out of their smartphone and ignoring this beautiful universe around them. And I think we have a, a, a balancing act here between technology on one hand and the philosophical aspects of the reality of life. And you need to balance the two. I mean, you really do need to make a connection with, you know, your spiritual side. Otherwise it atrophies. I mean, if you don't use it, you lose it. For every, uh, for every eight hours or for every, you could go maybe for every 48 hours of screen time, you got to eat a yeah. ground with yeah. mushrooms. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I prefer shiitake myself. <laughs> Yeah, I struggle with that one, though, because to, in some ways it's making us more connected and it's almost an allegory to the Matrix. It's, it's, uh, it's allowing us to have that social, uh, I, think, I think we have an innate social desire, right? Like, you know how you hear people about, you know, you're happiest when you have like this social, cohesive social group and all this, or you're there, we're actually not. Company. Yeah, and like how, you know, isolation is, is bad. So in some ways, the technology is helping us uh, is connect on a level that we've never, ever even thought possible before without it being some sort of um, yeah. metaphysical consciousness act. Yeah, and but the, the good thing about that is, is that there is a whole universe of information available to everybody on the web. I mean... It's getting in more increasingly difficult to hide the truth. Yeah. Because there are so many ways to find the truth out there. I mean, remote viewing is one because you can't lie to a remote viewer. I mean, you say that, you know, the, we, don't have a, we don't have a base at Area 51. There's <laughs> no way we have a base at Area 51. We don't even know what a Area 51 is. Well... Tell that to her, you know, you assign a remote viewer to that particular target, he's going to draw the whole thing. So you can't hide the truth from a, a remote viewer. And um, that's, uh, that's kind of like the, the internet in a way. It's really hard to hide the truth when there are so many things out there. If you lie about something in, in particular, like our government has been known to do from time to time, <laughs> Um, you're going to find the truth. I mean, and I'll give you a classic example of that that comes straight from my book. And that's the situation regarding the loss of um, the first pilot in the first Gulf War, uh, Michael Scott Spiker. Um, the Pentagon said that he was shot down during the first day of the war by an Iran. Uh, excuse me, Iraqi MiG-25, and that he died in the crash. Well, we know from a, for facts now, thanks to a young lady by the name of Amy Waters Jarsinski, hmm. did the uh, investigation into that and is chronicled in her book, um, An American in the Basement, and the prequel to it, the um, Nobody Left Behind, um, that this was not the truth. The truth of the matter is, Spiker was shot down, but it wasn't by the Iraqis. He was shot down by friendly fire. He was a victim of fratricide. Uh, due to uh, some miscommunications, he was hit by a, an AIM-7 missile from a Navy F-14. Oh, that, wow. That had been given the target by a, an AWACS aircraft where the controller had made a mistake, you know, it happens, you know, it's the fog of war. But unfortunately, it was, it was, the result of it was the fact that Spiker had been shot down by one of our own people. Early on. Early on, first day of the war. 
And the, the idea that he had died in the crash was subsequently shown to be wrong. He survived the crash. As a matter of fact, he tried to contact uh, search and rescue on a number of occasions by leaving messages in the desert using rocks spelled out, you know, his name and things like that. He hid for, for I think it was a year, if not more, with a, a band of Bedouins um, who, unfortunately for him, were antithetical to um, the Hussein regime. Huh. But unfortunately, you know, all the, all the um, interest in trying to find him at the time, because the family never, never thought the, the explanation given by the Pentagon was true, um, that interest kind of worked against Spiker, and he was eventually found by Saddam's forces. And the result of that was um, eventually the, you know, the capture and, and subsequent death in captivity and um, the massacre of the entire Bedouin tribe, men, women, and children, were hiding them. Well, it's, it's frustrating because even though these things do come to light, it feels like to me that it's, it's too late in a way, right? Like once you get that meme out there, once you get the mainstream talking about something, regardless of whether it's true or not, it's kind of already done a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's really sad because this man you know, put his life basically in, in our country. And, you know, the, the off mentioned term, you know, leave no one behind. Obviously he was one who fell through the cracks and he wasn't the only one. There were a number of others that fell through the cracks as well, but he's the one that I use in my book because I had a, a connection with that particular um, person. So, yeah, I mean, the government sometimes lies when they shouldn't. They should simply accept responsibility. But the problem with our government is, is that it's so hard to accept responsibility when you did something wrong. You know, I mean, you've got, I mean, the, you know, the tef Teflon responsibilities, I guess you call it, where everything slides off and everybody's pointing fingers, but nobody's accepting the responsibility for what happened. Mm -hmm. That's fortunate. Um, pretty much endemic with our government. Do you still uh, practice remote viewing yourself? Where are you at with it now, all, all these years later? Well, actually, I still work with um, Amy Waters Jarsinski on um, MIA and POW um, uh, matters. Oh, nice. And we do, uh, I still do remote viewing uh, operationally. Uh, I have worked on some uh, projects. Uh, since the book, and um, I, I can't go into them because they're they're actually confident. classified. Well, not classified. <laughs> uh, we won't uh, tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, good. Well, I know I can trust you guys. <laughs> so I what? You'll, I know you'll edit it out. So. Yeah. Exactly. So what? <laughs> what about the? Uh, what about the rumors that there is still a a Stargate happening? It's just not in the open anymore you know that's interesting um there are a number of people including several of the original military remote viewers who believe that um it's quite possible that they actually didn't um disband the unit they simply put it under a much deeper black program and the reason they did that was because of the expose given by dave morehouse's book like a warrior Wow, that was the book that kind of opened it up, eh? Yeah, yeah. there's been so much out there since, but I yeah. had I had that book on a cassette tape. <laughs> What's that? That Psychic Warrior book. What's a cassette tape? Oh, yeah, Darren doesn't even know what that is. Yeah. It's the one after the A-track. <laughs> <laughs> so well, is it like a, when you're going to remote view, is it like a whole production to get into, or is it like if you need to, can you be doing it like... 20 minutes you know what i mean no, like I is, does it ever come hat yeah well <laughs> oh. actually operational remote viewing yes it's, it's quite a project it's quite a process but um uh practice sessions or uh, uh demonstration sessions is fairly straightforward there's not that much to it i mean um 
I, when I was at the 2006 IRVA conference, which is the International Remote Viewing Association conference that they hold every year, um, they actually did, for those who were not remote viewers in the audience during one of the uh, presentations, um, I think it was, as a matter of fact, I would think it was by Stephen Schwartz, um, although don't quote me on that, but in any case, he gave the audience a target. And, you know, he said, this is the, uh, this, I have a target in mind, here are the coordinates. And for those of you who aren't remote viewers, that's all right, just simply sit back, relax, take some deep breaths, get nice and relaxed and comfortable, and just, you know, write down whatever comes up into your mind. So, you know, uh, the entire audience, um, did this remote viewing session together and there were some a number of guests of recognition when he popped the uh feedback pictures up um, 20 minutes later the actual target was the monorail system there at one of the um, uh, casinos and there were people going oh my god look look this is what i wrote this is what i wrote and these were non remote viewers so as I said, you know, this is a this is a uh, a basic um, innate human ability. Everybody has the ability to do it. So I've got a proposition for you, and if it if it's too much, you can, or if you don't if you don't have the time, you, of course you can you can opt out, and I can just edit this out. But um, this episode will come out in about two and a half weeks, probably in podcast form, which is where most of our audience is. Mm -hmm. So if we were to email you the coordinates of the studio, maybe you could, uh, in that time, send us back a picture and we could use it for the episode art. Hmm. An interesting thought. I would not be... Adverse to that? Adverse to that. It, it's not the real coordinates, though, Darren. It's not like you give them, like, a east and west. It's just coordinates as we make, we would make up coordinates. Like, just how many numbers is it again? Um, I usually use two sets of four numbers. Two sets of four numbers. So you would yeah. just, we would, you know, both give them a set of numbers with our intention on the studio. It wouldn't be the actual coordinates. Right. Oh, right. You'll have to right. show me how to do that. Okay. <laughs> but remember that remote viewing is driven by intention. So whoever makes up those numbers, um, how you would do it is simply uh, write down the intention that the viewer is going to be viewing the outside of the studio, or that the studio is the uh, the target, and or whatever you desire to be the target it doesn't have to be, it can be virtually anything, and um, um, put that you know assign the numbers to it with the idea that yes, this is what I want him to view, and then send me the um, the uh, coordinates. Okay, cool. We'll do that. Yeah, we'll, yeah, sweet. And then we'll put it out if, uh, yeah, we'll put it out in the as the episode art. Sure. And then maybe I'm gonna get I'm gonna test your ability too, Graham. We should no, start already, training. Really, you. <laughs> I've already taken a couple courses. It's really hard. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I can't even <laughs> meditate <laughs> or sit still. <laughs> you know what might be inter even more interesting though? If I gave you guys coordinates to a target of my choosing okay have you do it you see people if i do it it's it's what we call the dog and pony show um as a matter of fact most of the remote viewers don't usually do this anymore simply because people will go well they cheated or you know he, they they looked up the target or you know they it come all sorts of different excuses oh totally right so the remote viewers, by and large, unless it's under um, certain controlled circumstances, don't usually do that type of thing anymore, simply because it's... It's, it's fodder for the skeptics. Yeah, it's really, it's, yeah, we're not trying to prove anything here. We're just, we would just do it for fun, yeah. But yeah. doing it the way I suggest, where I'm not doing the viewing, it's you guys are doing the viewing, who are not remote viewers, but... This will show that, you know, everybody has this ability. Anybody can do this. 
And then two people who are not trained in remote viewing, who got these coordinates and simply sat back in their chair, closed their eyes, maybe turned the light down a little bit, and just, you know, wrote down whatever happened to pop up in their mind and see how close you get. I that sounds great. Yeah, I'm right. up for the challenge. I think you would be very surprised. So I just think and draw a picture? Um, I'm going to think of a target for you, and I'm going to give you the coordinates. And then you don't think and draw a picture, Darren. I, 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 don't, I think you want to try and get your brain out of the way, right? And, and really get into that theta state that we talk about in here and almost be like half asleep and then... Focus on the coordinates and then probably. And then we'll split the, uh, we'll combine them both into one picture, use that as the episode art, and people can guess whose is whose. <laughs> right and on. I have the target and I have the coordinates for you. I'm ready. To do you, are you going to give them to, to us now or do you want to email yeah. them? Okay. I'll give it to you right now. Okay, sure. Uh, the coordinates for your target are. Two one zero five six six one one. The All target, right. the target is to be described in present time. Okay. Okay. This will preclude you from, you know, sliding up and down the <laughs> timeline, if yeah, you will, yeah. existence. I don't think that's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, so um, is this time sensitive or can we do it like nope. at our own leisure? Do it at your leisure. And then what I want you to do is to uh, just simply, you know, write down your impressions, sketches, you know, any, any thoughts that come to mind on the target. And then um, when you are ready uh, for your uh, feedback, let me know and I'll email you the target. Great. Perfect. And I, I think... We got a couple of people in the chat room asking if the listeners can do it too. I suppose I suppose they oh, could, and they could just e sure. we, they can just email them to us. Yeah, actually, they could. They, and I don't think we need to. We don't need to send them all to John. If you want, yeah. we could, but it could be a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that way. Besides, I would rather you guys see because I already know what you're going to be. Okay. See. So let's. Uh, you should put those numbers in the chat room, then, Darren, if you don't mind. That's two one zero five six six one one, and I'll put them in the show notes as well for right. people listening to the podcast. All right, yeah. Invite your listen, all of your listeners, to write down their impressions. All you have to do is simply relax, take some deep breaths, put everything out of your mind. You know, just put aside the the, the smartphone, oh, put that's... aside the TV, <laughs> your day. Put, yeah, put aside the computers, all that stuff. Just sit back and just relax. And just let the, you know, start a dialogue with your unconscious and see what bubbles up. I think you will be, as well as your listeners, will be very surprised. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's good. Thanks. Okay. Take about, you know, 15, maybe 15 minutes. That's all you really need to do, 15, 20 minutes or so. It's, you know, it's a nice way to, you know, put everything aside for that short period of time and just, Sit and relax for a moment and get and get comfortable and you know see what bubbles up. I have a really good target for you too. I think. Okay. Really so uh, that's good. We'll do that. Maybe okay. it's our studio. <laughs> no, you can't start guessing now. <laughs> before uh, before we wrap it up, John, it's been a great chat. Um, do you have anything uh, you want to let any of our listeners know? Anything, anything you want to let them know, or uh, where they can track you down? Um, actually, you can track me down at www.asorcerersapprentice.com. Uh, that's my blog, and um, you can contact me through my email at uh, johnherlowski at gmail.com. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we'll make sure we put that in the show notes. Are you on, you're not on the Twitter or the Facebook or any of those fun things? No, actually, I am on Facebook. You're more than welcome to... Friend me. I answer everybody's emails. I will answer um, as many questions as I possibly can. I I friend easily. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, it's been a it's been a fantastic time. I can't wait to get down to this this little experiment. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting to see what the listeners send in. 
And uh, yeah, See, thanks. That's, oh. that's exactly the way you should approach it too. This is going to be fun. Yeah, totally. That's what it's all about. In the meantime, we'll open up some minds and we'll uh, explore the infinite possibilities. Yeah, we encourage everyone to check out the book. Yes. You yes. got the book in front of you there, Graham? Yeah, you bet. It's a Sorcerer's Apprentice, a skeptic's journey into the CIA's Project Stargate. Thanks so much, John. It's been great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoyed my time here with you today. Excellent. We'll forward you a copy when it's out. Oh, I'd love it. I'll put it on my website. That was our chat with John Herlowski, the Sorcerer's Apprentice himself. Yeah. Project Stargate. I'm glad we got into that, man. I was a bit hesitant because we've talked about remote viewing quite a bit, but have we? Yeah. Yeah, we did. We we did it. We've uh, we've had you know remote viewing teachers on before, but we want to th thank John for coming That's on right. and getting into a deeper level of it. Yeah, that was a great one, and of course. All you guys have your assignment. Me and me and Graham are gonna try our coordinates. See what we come up with. We'll report back, and then send us send us in whatever you guys get, and then we're gonna send that shit off to John too, and he can yeah tell us who is if any of our listeners are closest or what it is. So we'll we'll see if any of you guys are remote viewers. I have the coordinates here. They are two one zero five six six one one. Now, that's present time coordinates, so you don't have to go back or forward in time. We do want to just say that. And uh, jot down your impressions, your sketches, your thoughts, your feelings. Synchronicities. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. So send them in to us. Now, we're going to have how, how long, Darren? Two weeks? Two weeks. So it'll be uh, the second show after this one that comes out. Right there? Yes. Yeah. Two weeks, so it'll be, you have to have them in by, well, no, we'll give them two and a half weeks because of our recording schedule. Okay, so it'll come out the third podcast after this one. Yeah. And we'll mention it probably after each each in, intro or outro, yeah, if, so, if we can remember. So try and have them in by the, what the fuck is it today, the 20th? 19th. Oh, yeah. 19th. 19th. So try and have them in by like the... 6th, 7th of June. Yeah. So, yeah, I, lo I love that story about John. I love the skeptic story, turning believer, like you're turning into like having that awakening of, holy shit, there's way more to, to this life. And he had that uh, sort of premonition about 9-11 or that whole scenario around 9-11. Interesting stuff. And he saw her face. Oh, he's a believer. Yeah, that's right. In a trace. What about what you see? You're a little biased. What Why? if a believer turns skeptic? They do all the time. Is that okay? Is that? Yeah, but it might not be based on experience, and it's just based on a worldview. But yeah, believers turn skeptic. What the, you know? I just don't think that's as you know fun of a way to go. <laughs> 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 It's not as a podcast worthy of a story when someone's like this, fuck this. No, look, Mike and Hanks talks about that on the Grayling Report all the time, right? Some of these guys start out investigating as a believer, right? Or they want to believe, like Connor Habib would say. But what happens is after all the research and all that lack of real direct evidence, because everybody needs to prove, prove that this stuff is real, right? Not based on experience, but based on some 
measuring system that we don't even have access to right now. And if they can't do that, then they become skeptical. It seems to be happening. Even Red Pill Junkie's pretty skeptical about a lot of stuff, like more so than I would have originally thought. Not in a negative way, but I think those are some of the guys that go the other way, right? Because they're kind of on the front lines, like writing about the stuff, researching it. Like we just talk about it. It's a little more casual for us, but those guys are kind of like out there doing it, right? And I think that they have a hard time not being skeptical because they don't have that physical measurable proof. Until Red has his psychedelic experience and his trip report, and until Micah Hanks like sees an alien walking around in his front yard, like there's not going to be enough evidence for these guys, right? Yeah. No. I've seen enough. Have you? Of what? St- I've seen some stuff. Have you? <laughs> I still need your trip report. <laughs> you got to. There's. Darren's got one in the can. I did? Yeah, you've got that. The one that I thought I shit my pants? No, the one oh. you thought you were dying or whatever, that one. Oh, that one. Yeah. Oh, that was one. That was kind of, yeah. I mean, right, let's talk about that one one day. Maybe. That one's a doozy. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> you might not want to put that out in the, no, for the I, world that to hear about. Might, not, might be best kept at the hip. <laughs> Maybe we can just mention it, like, just a little bit one day. We don't have to get into, like, all the details. Easter eggs. Yeah. I don't know. That one was pretty intense. It's not something you would advise (laughs) anybody to do. The set and setting definitely wasn't there. (laughs) At five five in the morning. (laughs) No, you don't want to take any heroic doses of anything else at five in the morning. It's a bunch of strangers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think that's about it. As always, support the show, gramerica.ca slash support. Uh, sign up for the newsletter, gramerica.ca slash news. Fucking spam, Graham. You guys have been slacking on that big time. Spam them. Send them some stories. And uh, missing something. That's it, buddy. You always say that, and then we miss something. Well, we're always missing. We're not supposed to catch everything. That's the whole point of this, is it's kind of wing it and do it as we go. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening.
I say, chaps, there's been a fair amount of whinging over this voicemail app and on your website, don't you think? I say, just let it happen.